Uh, my name is Ashley Davis. Uh, tonight I'm talking about an application I created called Data Forge Notebook. This is something I've created um, completely in my spare time. Um, it's, it's been ongoing. My, I, I looked at my commits the other day. My first commit to the repo was almost a year ago. So I'm actually planning at the moment on hitting version one um, in about a month, and that'll be a year after I started it. Uh, in that time, um, I've actually been selling it. So, so people who've been buying this, I've been selling it under what I call the early access program. So people who love the idea can come sort of come on board and support me to get it to, to version one. And uh, from there, um, you know, hopefully people keep buying it and keep supporting it. <clears throat> um, if anyone wants to get in touch, uh, I've got my email on Twitter up there. I'm going to put it up again at the end, and I'll be putting these slides online later as well. So if you want to catch up. So uh, what am I going to cover? Um, I'm going to give a bit of a demo of, of the product. So this is a product that's built on Electron. I'm going to talk about some of the technical aspects, the tech stack that's in there. I'm going to show a minimal Electron app um, and show you how you can get started quickly with it. I'm going to give you a bit of a look at the structure of my application um, and uh, basically some tips on how some issues you'll face putting together a complicated um, application with Electron. Um, originally, I was going to talk about some of the business stuff as well, and I, I think I put that on um, the, the proposal for the talk, but it was it was like way over time, so I basically have stripped that. But if anyone wants to ask questions about you know how I market it, how I sell it, that kind of thing, um, ask at the end. If we don't have time, you know, catch up with me later. So a little bit about me. Um, I've been working as a developer for over 20 years. Um, I've spent the last few years basically just working on startups, so contracting for startups, uh, working on various startups. My current startup is uh, Sortal, and if you've heard of it, you know it's um, it's a, a photo management, a digital asset management system that's powered by machine learning. On the side, um, the last year, like I said, I've been working on Data Forge Notebook. So I've always, uh, over almost the entire time I've been a developer, I've had uh, hobby projects and open source projects on the go on the side. And I recommend that to anyone as, as a way to kind of learn. Um, and also, if you're doing the open source stuff, you know, show off your skills, um, contribute to a team, and participate with other people. <clears throat> this, um, I should say as well, that this application um, is a bit of an achievement for me as well, because it's, uh, after many years of wanting to do this, it's, it's the first product that I've built entirely by myself, um, and I'm actually selling it. You know, I've, I've, I've worked on countless open source projects and hobby projects that I've never shown the world as well. Um, but this is the first one where um, I don't know if I can make a business out of it. I don't know if it's, it's going to be that, um, you know, be that good, but like I'm pretty happy with where it's at otherwise. Oh, and I wrote a book. Um, I've got some copies. I'm going to give uh, away a couple of copies of uh, Data Wrangling with JavaScript tonight. And there's also um, a free code for the software in, in the front of each book as well. So if you like the demonstration, um, you can get a free copy of that. And for everyone else, I've got um, discount codes for the book and the software at the end of the talk. So uh, my theme obviously tonight is Electron. Um, this is the framework on which I've built DataForge Notebook. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a platform for building uh, desktop, cross-platform desktop applications uh, using web technologies. And you can see up here all the icons of all the kind of apps that have been um, been made with this as well. And these, these are just the popular ones, the well-known ones, because there must be countless others that have been built with Electron. Um, you guys probably recognize some of these. I use some of these um, on a day-to-day -day basis. <clears throat> so before we get into the talk, I, I kind of want to give you a bit of background as to how I came to be working on this. Um, before JavaScript, in the time before JavaScript, I spent a lot of time working in C++, C Sharp, and a bit of Python. I was doing, um, probably about five years ago or something now, I, I was doing data analysis in Python and Pandas. I didn't become an expert in that or anything, but, but I knew um, early on that I'd want to be doing this stuff at, like at some point in JavaScript. <clears throat> so initially I was doing some back-end work in Python as well, so naturally I kind of migrated all that to, to Node.js once I got more and more into JavaScript. Um, these days, I'm, I'm pretty much full JavaScript. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll work in anything depending on the job, um, but I've, I've managed to kind of get my career to the spot where it's it's all JavaScript and um, even uh, mostly TypeScript these days. But you know, it's, it's all JavaScript underneath. <clears throat> so.
So there was a point where I had to ask myself this question, and it was like, like, you know, why was I doing data analysis in Python? Um, I, eventually, I want to run it like in a production server, running on top of Node.js. So I want I want that code to be in JavaScript from the start. That's like the ideal. <clears throat> so that led to um, what became my mission, which was basically to improve a lot of. Um, JavaScript programmers working with data, improve the tools they've got, the capabilities they've got, and also a bit of education as well. So where did that take me? Um, my, my biggest open source project, I think, is, is DataForge, which has been ongoing for quite a few years now. Um, and it, that was my sort of effort to take um, Python, or Pandas, which is a, a data science toolkit in Python, to bring that into the JavaScript world. <coughs> And uh, later on, I added uh, DataForge Plot, which is like an add-on to DataForge, but it extends it with visualization capabilities. And it was an important stepping stone for, for DataForge Notebook, but I'll talk about that a bit later if we, if we have time. Um, and I've also created a bunch of other stuff. I've got a bunch of other stuff on my GitHub, a couple of orgs that I created. Um, ultimately, it was my work with data in JavaScript that led me to kind of pitching my book idea to, to Manning, uh, a US tech publisher. And, um, and two years later, I had a book out. <clears throat> and last year, as the, that book was coming to a close, and I was doing less and less work on that, and I was looking for something else to occupy my spare time, um, well, actually, not really, because I mean, I've, I've been thinking about DataForge Notebook for a long time, and thinking there needed to be something like Jupyter Notebook for, for JavaScript. Um, and I've done a few prototypes over the years; nothing had ever worked out. Um, but after I had a holiday from working on the book, and uh, I, I did another prototype, and everything just fell into place. All the tech fell into place. Other people were interested in it, and it just took off from there. <clears throat> so if you're wondering what this thing is, um, if you know what Jupyter Notebook is, then you already kind of know what this is. Um, otherwise, I've got a bit of explaining to you probably. Um, Jupyter Notebook is a, uh, an exploratory data analysis environment. Um, it's normally used by data science um, guys for, for exploring data, making visualizations, doing all sorts of coding. Uh, you can preview your data in a tabular format. You can uh, plot data in a chart. Unfortunately, to use this, you have to code in Python. So, <laughs> that, was a, that was a big downside for me. Um, and there's nothing wrong with Python. I don't, I don't know denigrate Python. I just sort of got into JavaScript, as probably many of you have done. And, and that's, that's where I wanted to work. <clears throat> So did anyone ever use Jupyter Notebook and think like, I, I would like to see this for JavaScript? Mm. Well, a couple of people, that's cool. <laughs> I thought there was, you could have Node.js kernels and stuff like that with Jupyter. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I tried that, um, and, and it's, it's a pain to set up. And, and I wanted something that was sort of, you know, very specific to JavaScript and, and just worked without any kind of setup or messing around. And, and also when I tried putting the JavaScript kernel into Python, like I couldn't get any of the data, the visualization stuff working. That was a couple of years ago. It, it might have come away since then. I'm not sure. <clears throat> but yeah, I, I created DataForge Notebook to really to fill that gap for myself. Um, but I only I only really achieved it. I only kind of went forward with it because people started paying for it. Um, I recommend anyone who's kind of trying to get something off the ground, you know, wh whether it's something you want to sell or whether it's something you, you an open source project you want to make, as early as possible get other people involved because when the going gets tough and, and you kind of the initial kind of novelty wears off, you know, it's the people that are interested in it that will kind of keep you going and keep you working on it. <clears throat> so this is this is um, like Jupyter Notebook but specific for JavaScript, right? Um, it's um, uh, in many ways also I think it's better than Jupyter Notebook. I mean that's sort of blowing my horn a bit but um, uh, you can make up your own mind on that. Um, there'll be a lot of data scientists that disagree with me. Um, so this is an interactive and exploratory uh, programming environment. Um, anything that you can do in Node.js, you, you can do in this. <clears throat> um, it uses an embedded version of Node.js, Node.js version 10, to, to run your code. Later on, I want to make it so that you can plug in uh, and manage any version of Node.js. But for the moment, it just, it just comes with that out of the box. Uh, I like to think of it as like a REPL uh, on steroids. You probably, as a day-to-day -day coder, you wouldn't spend a lot of time here, but it's really great for looking at data and doing quick stuff and, and bootstrapping projects. 
So this takes uh, Python style transformation and, and data analysis and, um, and puts it in a spot where basically you can, you can do that with JavaScript. And also it, it connects it together with JavaScript's uh, rich visualization ecosystem. And so that's, a, that's another point to this, is a lot of the stuff that happens in Python, all the data analysis, it ends up in JavaScript anyway, because that, that's the interactive visualization format for the web. And that's where you get to see stuff. Yeah, that's where you get to see the, the data in visual form. So this is all the features, and I'm going to show you some of this in the demo, so it's, it's not worth reading all that, but uh, one key point is the idea of zero configuration. So you just install DataForge Notebook and you start coding. You don't have to configure any project. Um, you don't have to create um, any build scripts or anything like that. You don't have to install Node.js. Um, you don't even have to manually install NPM modules. It does that for you as you're coding. And it automatically sets up your package file. And um, demo gods be good. I'll, I'll show you how that works in a second. <coughs> Uh, it's got built-in visualizations for various data formats, so it can visualize um, JavaScript arrays, objects, it can visualize tabular data and charts. I'll show you that. And at the end of this, um, you can export your, your code to runnable JavaScript or a runnable Node.js project. So, fingers crossed this all works. So this is the uh, default notebook that you see the first time you run it. Just kind of aim to give you a bit of an explanation of, of what it is. Can everyone see that okay? I might, um, I might just get rid of that. <clears throat> so I'm just going to save this. Uh, before I save it, I just want to show you that I'm starting with uh, an empty directory. So this is my demo directory. There's nothing in there. That'll be important in a moment. I'm going to save my notebook. So that's there now. Now, if you're interested in the technical aspects, it's just a JSON file. That's the first cell. That's the second cell. So you can intersperse uh, Markdown with code. So you use your Markdown here basically to kind of document what you're doing. And then you've got uh, JavaScript code here. Any, anything that you can run under Node.js you can put in here. Um, click the button to run it. Output comes up underneath each cell. So you can easily add new code cells. And quickly iterate on your code to, to, to try stuff out. <clears throat> this also supports TypeScript, by the way, as well. So you can see up here that this is a JavaScript notebook, but um, TypeScript is working. There's a few little quirks with it, and I'm still trying to resolve, but essentially it works. Um, you can move these things around, move these cells around through drag and drop. Now here's something cool. I'm going to start using my cheat sheet now, just so you don't have to watch me typing code. So I'm going to um, use an NPM module called Axios. You can see up here, it's automatically installing that. So that's automatically going out to NPM and installing it. If we go back to the directory here, you can see we've got a node modules directory now. It's installed Axios and the dependencies of Axios. It's set up a package file for us. <clears throat> so you can see we've got an uh, Axios dependency in the package file now. So uh, Axios is a tool for hitting uh, or making HTTP requests. So I'm going to do a demonstration that's getting data from uh, a REST API. This is um, a URL that will get uh, stock market data from Microsoft. I'm going to call um, Axios's uh, get function to get the data, and then I'm just going to console log it. So we, this is just the first step, really. Hopefully the Wi-Fi wi wi hotspot's working. So you can see we've got a bunch of uh, stock market data here. Now this is just a wall of data, so it's uh, not very useful in that format. To make 
make some sense of it, I'm going to use DataForge. You could, you could pretty much do this any way you want, um, any, any kind of seri CSV deserialization. Um, you can see here that it's installing DataForge. So now we'll have that in our package file. <clears throat> I'm going to use DataForge's from CSV function to, to deserialize it. And then to look at it, um, I'm going to use DataForge's display function. So that's a special DataForge only function that we can use to preview our data. So that gives us a nice uh, tabular sort of spreadsheet style view of the data. But it's a little bit too much still. Uh, normally we want to preview a little bit less, so I can preview the first, uh, just the first five rows of it. Um, and because it's CSV, and which is basically a, a format serialized to a text file, it's, a, it's all the data is strings, and I need to I need to actually uh, deserialize it to numbers and dates. So I turn on dynamic typing, uh, which is going to parse all the numbers for me. And then I have for, for, for the dates, I have to kind of tell it what format to use. This isn't going to have any visual change, but it's needed for, for doing the actual uh, charting that I'm going to do in a second. I'm going to add a new code cell. I'm using DataForge plot, which is like a bridge between um, DataForge and the, the plotting sort of uh, format that uh, DataForge Notebook uses. What that does is it extends DataForge, so my, my data frame now has a plot function. Um, but to do something with that, I need to still call this display function, right? So that, this will give us the most sort of basic, naive version of the chart there is. <clears throat> um, but this isn't very good because the volume is such a huge value there that it kind of overwhelms all the other data. And it's, and it's not really what I wanted, so I'm going to just cut down on the amount of data that's actually being rendered there. And I'm also going to put the timestamp on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, I'll put the, the closing price for Microsoft. This gives us a much more readable chart. Now, um, this is this, the charting is based on Apex charts that you're looking at here. Um, it's got some cool features like being able to zoom in. There's also um, normally a panning button here as well to go into panning mode, but for some reason that's broken. By the way, this, this demo is like hot off the press. It's like a build that I did this morning that was being coded on over the weekend. So um, you might see a few little issues. One nice thing you get out of this um, is the ability to kind of download an SVG or, or a PNG file of that individual chart that you just created. <clears throat> now, I've got one more uh, example that I'm going to give you in, in this demo, and that's uh, loading a, a CSV file. But to load a file, I need a separate DataForge plugin. So that's installing DataForge FS, which um, adds uh, file system functionality to DataForge. Um, I, originally, I had all the file system functions integrated into the DataForge package, but then people started using it in the browser and complaining about it, so I had to, I had to kind of split that out. So you can use um, this DataForge library, you can use it in the browser. Um, so I'm going to load a CSV file, and I'm just going to print the first five lines of it. Whoops, I don't have the CSV file there. I'm just going to copy that over. That's because I started with an empty directory. So I'm just going to copy the CSV file into my next to my notebook. So then I can basically reference uh, files with a relative path to my notebook. It's a good error though. Hmm. Um, you can also load JSON files um, through this mechanism. Um, and because you can load uh, any NPM module you want in here, you can you can get like SQL libraries. Um, you can use MongoDB. You can use anything you can access through NPM, any any kind of database or, or file format. Um, you can install and start using it. <clears throat> so just to show you another type of chart, I'm going to render this as a bar chart. Apex Charts has uh, support for heaps of different types of charts, so you've got you've got plenty of options. Um, I've got an example I'll show you at the end, probably. Um, Actually, no, I'll show, I'll show you that in a moment. Um, just a few other types of charts. I haven't, I haven't covered every type of chart with examples, but um, that, that will be coming soon.
Yeah, so I think the last thing is just to show you here um, of the export formats. So uh, when you've got a notebook here, you can export it as a whole bunch of different things. You can capture it as a PNG image. Uh, you, can, you can export it to a PDF document. You can export it as an interactive web page. Um, if you've seen my blog or uh, things that I share on Twitter, I, I often kind of export these things and share them. Um, you can export to Markdown, which is suitable to, to chuck into GitHub and actually view through um, GitHub's uh, Markdown renderer. And you can get code out. Obviously, um, if you export a single file, it's going to just pull out all the JavaScript, ignoring all the Markdown, and you've got a single runnable file. Um, but you can also export a complete runnable Node.js project. So that'll, that'll um, include your package.json. It installs all your packages ready for it to run. And if you're in a TypeScript notebook, it'll set up all your TypeScript uh, configuration as well. Uh, it also comes with a bunch of examples. So these are the examples that come with it, and um, I'm adding more all the time. Um, so here's a visualization example. So you've got uh, console logging, uh, visualizing JavaScript arrays, visualizing JavaScript objects, uh, just previewing a, a JavaScript object uh, in a table format. It's got basic support for rendering HTML, which I really want to make more sophisticated in the future so that we can do more kind of uh, HTML style visualizations that are, that are very custom. Obviously, we've got uh, tabular data that we've seen and charts. I'll just show you quickly um, some of the other chart types. And you might have noticed that it, it, it captures all your charts as well. <coughs> so it's captured, like I ran this. Uh, you know, I probably tested this a few days ago, and it's captured the chart into the notebook. So as soon as you run the notebook, you don't have to. As soon as you open the notebook, you don't have to run the code. Your charts are just there. So we've got time series bar charts, area charts, uh, multiple series on the on the one chart. We've got an example of a second y-axis here, um, stacking multiple charts, and um, there's, there's heaps more you can do with the Apex charting library. So um, I'm going to be adding more to this. Example in time. Now let's talk about some technical stuff. So this is my tech stack. Um, obviously, it's built on Electron, um, and that means I can deploy to Windows, Linux, and Mac. And I've actually, you know, I have I have users of this platform on um, of this software on all of those platforms. UI is completely built in React. Um, I've used TypeScript across, across the board. Um, that wasn't always the case. It started with JavaScript, but pretty early on I migrated it to TypeScript. I used the uh, Monaco editor for the, for the code cells. That's the editor you get in Visual Studio Code. Um, charting is done with Apex Charts and C3. Uh, I do unit testing with Jest. Um, and for my, my build process, um, which I'll be able to show you what a, what a basic Electron build process looks like in a moment, um, it's just a bunch of shell scripts, like one shell script per platform, and plus I'm using the package Electron Builder, which makes it really easy to kind of build and install up. <clears throat> so um, what is Electron? Um, it's a very successful open source project. It's about five years old now. It's a way of packaging a, a desktop application that's both a browser application and a web application kind of, kind of jammed into one. Um, the browser part of this equation means that it's really easy to take an existing web page and just basically bundle it as a, uh, as a desktop application, which you've probably seen if you use something like Slack. Um, you know, it, it looks a lot like the web page has just been shoehorned into it. Um, um, obviously, there's a bit, a bit more work to do there, but um, um, it's, it's, it makes that really doable. Um, but then above and beyond the browser, you get access to all the Node.js uh, APIs, like access to the file system and stuff like that. So you get the combined benefits of working in the browser and working in Node.js. Um, Electron is, is actually based on Chrome, and, but more specifically it's based on the Chrome renderer, not, not the kind of the full Chrome application. Um, so it, it is quite actually uh, probably fairly cut down compared to Chrome. Um, so why did I choose Electron? Um, there's a bunch of reasons that are important to me. Um, firstly, just because it's JavaScript, <laughs> like, well, this is JavaScript, it, uh, it, it fits well with you know, the way I want to work and, and my overall overarching mission. Um, also because it's cross-platform and like I, I wanted to hit, I knew I wanted to hit every platform. I knew that developers have varying tastes um, 
And it's been interesting. Normally, I, I would work on Windows, but I've actually, you know, probably worked a bit more on Mac and Linux now, and get more of an appreciation for what it's like to develop on those platforms. Um, I also like it because it uh, helps me leverage my existing web tech skills. So, um, I mean, I've got a background in building UIs and Windows Forms and uh, Windows Presentation Framework from, from years ago. Um, I wouldn't want to go back to that. Like, working with web tech is so much nicer than working with the old kind of native kind of desktop frameworks. <clears throat> um, Electron also, though, has, it has, even though it's not a native app per se, um, it does have native menus and various native integrations, so if you make use of those, it can make your app feel very much like a native desktop app. Electron's really easy to get started with, and it's very easy to build and installer. Um, if I've got a moment, um, I'll show you that shortly. Um, the community support is really good, and there's really good documentation and examples and help. Um, I, um, some things I haven't made use of yet that would like to in the future are crash reporting and um, automatic updating. So apparently, um, Electron just supports those things out of the box, and maybe you have to write you know, a server to communicate with or something like that. But um, that's something I plan to explore in the future. Um, I've got a, a fork of the Electron Quick Start. I'm just going to bring that up. Um, the, the original uh, Electron Quick Start. You can get to if you, if you look at where I forked it from. Um, like it's really simple and really basic, and, and it's just really easy to get started with. But there was a couple of things that I wanted to add. I think it's basically that I wanted just wanted to add um, an example of Electron Builder and how easy it is to build an installer, which you don't get in the original Quick Start. <clears throat> I'll probably come back to this in a moment, actually, because um, yeah, I'm just going to cover a little bit more background stuff first before we look at some more details of Electron. Um, a most basic Electron app is composed of two processes, the main process uh, and the renderer process. Now the main process is basically Node.js but with some special APIs added and this um, uh, integration of Chrome that you can call on to, to kind of instantiate a browser window. <coughs> um, obviously it contains some um, special APIs for, for all the Electron stuff. The renderer process is uh, basically the browser window, and it's a separate process for running your web page. But it also, um, optionally, you can turn on Node.js. So that means, kind of from within your web page, you get access to all the file system and process management and all the good stuff that you get with Node.js. <clears throat> and of course, it's also got you know special uh, APIs for integration with Electron. Um, now, Electron automatically links your processes via inter-process communication. That's kind of automatic, and it allows you to really easily send um, JSON messages between the two processes to have them communicate you know, and say what the state of the application is. <clears throat> so the reason it has separate processes is because you can actually have like multiple browser windows open, each in their own process, um, and, and all basically being coordinated through the main process. And if you know how um, Chrome works, it's, it's very similar to, to the concept of how Chrome works, where each tab in your browser effectively runs in a separate process and, and is isolated from all the others. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to have a bit more of a look at the Electron app. How am I going for time? For 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah, let's, uh, let's quickly look at this. Um, so, let's start with the package file, which I've got open here. Did have open. So this is the package file for a minimal Electron application. Um, I might yeah. just zoom in a bit. So um, you can see here, let's look at the dependencies. Um, Electron is a dev dependency. Uh, Electron Builder is a dev dependency. Um, to, to start it in development, we run npm start, but that just runs Electron in the current directory. So that, that's enough for development purposes. Um, and to build it, we want Electron Builder in the current directory. Um, and there's not much more than this for, for cross-platform building. Um, I assume if you just run it like, like this, that it will build it for whatever platform you're on. But you can also put a command line on there to say, you know, build Mac or build Linux, um, or, or specifically build Windows. Now, the main process here is bootstrapped by this main.js here. And actually, just looking at the package file again, you can see here, this is how you tell Electron you know, what your main file is. This 
there's a fair bit in this file, um, so I'm, I'm just going to kind of cover just a little bit. I mean, but th this is kind of what you need to know, right? This is what's creating the browser window, and this is what's turning on the Node.js integration. So that, that means you get the Node APIs in your browser window. This this function here is loading your web page, so that that's what's actually going to define the UI basically for your application. I've got that open here. <clears throat> I'll just queue that one up as well. So this is just a regular HTML file, except you'll notice it's got a call to Node.js require here, and that's pulling in the code for our our UI for our, our renderer process. And that's the renderer.js file, which is like just empty here, like because I mean this this doesn't really do anything, and, and there's a bit of um, there's a bit of code executing here anyway in the HTML to kind of to make it look interesting. Um, so I'll quickly show you how to use that. So you clone the repo from GitHub, um, you type npm install. Do you want me to find it right? Oh yeah. Can I do that? <laughs> no, no, it's not working. Oh, it, you don't, it's really simple anyway, right? npm install. Hopefully most of you know how to do that. <laughs> that. That installs all your dependencies. And then you do npm start. And you know you, you, from this point you've got something you can develop on. And then you type, with, with my version of the quick start, my fork version, not, not with the original version, you can do npm run build. And that'll build you, in this case, this will build you uh, a Windows PC installer, which I probably haven't tested properly. So I don't know if this is actually going to work, but hopefully it will. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate the original version because it's it's simple and 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 also there's multiple options for how you how you build a bundle, so um, I might leave that run anyway. <clears throat> so uh, Electron is pretty good, but um, like all sort of development environments, development platforms, it has problems. Um, it makes it a lot easier to make uh, cross-platform applications, but it it doesn't completely take away cross-platform issues. And sometimes you just need to write separate codes for separate platforms. I'm going to show you an example of that on the next slide. Cross-platform testing is always painful. Uh, unfortunately, you have to do it regularly, and you have to do it on each of the platforms that you support. Um, generally speaking, JavaScript is cross-platform, but you can't just take it for granted, because here you're dealing with like Node.js APIs you know, for the file system, for process management, and, and other things that have platform-specific um, quirks. You can't just assume it's what you, the code you write on Windows, so it's going to work on every platform. Um, the fact that you have a browser and Node.js bundled together um, can cause some problems. Um, and I think they might have actually fixed this appropriately now, because in the early days, like years ago when I first started playing around with Electron, um, you could take an existing web page, bung it in, and Node.js was uh, enabled by default, right? So um, those sort of browser packages, if they weren't built to handle to work with Node.js, it was going to cause problems, but the way it, the way it works now is that when you uh, create your browser window, Node.js integration is disabled by default, and you have to turn it on. Um, so if you are trying to take an existing web page and bring it in, and you don't need all the Node.js APIs, it might be easier to leave that uh, turned off ra ra rather than trying to get it working. <clears throat> Another thing to be aware of is that Electron has its own customized file system, um, and it, it overrides the default um, Node.js file system API. I'm going to talk about that in a slide coming up if we've got time. Um, automated integration or automated UI testing seems pretty difficult in Electron. Like, there's a couple of ways to kind of, I think, extend Test Cafe and Cypress to support it, but I've tried it, you know, in, in a small amount, of, I've tried a couple of times to get it working, in it, and it's just in the too hard basket for the moment. Um, but, I, but I'd love to get that working in the future. Um, possibly the biggest downside of working with Electron is the bundle size. Um, which has been huge, and, and with Electron 5, it, it, it seems to get better. Like it, um, but still, uh, my application is uh, 140 meg on PC, um, and it's roughly the same on Linux and Mac OS. Uh, Visual, to, to make a comparison, Visual Studio Code weighs in at about 70 meg, so that's kind of like a benchmark that I'm kind of aiming to get close to, and, it, and it's pretty sophisticated, so I should be able to should be able to get to that hopefully. Um, the, the default um, quick start 
I think the, the bundle ends up being about 30, 40 meg, which is actually significantly smaller than it used to be if you ever you know, tried using Electron a few years ago. Um, uh, here's a pro tip. Um, I, you know, the, the quick start sort of makes you think you should actually build it from the same directory as your source code. Whereas in my, my build script, I copy everything to a separate directory where I can basically, I can scrutinize everything that goes into the package. And because you, you end up with old dependencies and sometimes, you know, some, some things are huge and bring in all their other crap and you don't, you don't need it. Um, you might have uh, wanted to install a dev dependency, but it's ended up being production or something like that. Um, it gives you the chance to check if you build from a separate directory. Um, uh, one way this, this size situation could improve soon as well. Um, I got um, cut a canary down here. Um, is um, this work being done to strip the Electron framework from the bundle, kind of like like a like a pre-install, kind of like the way the .NET framework works, where you where you either pre-install it or it already exists on your Windows PC when you get it, and then each after that each .NET application is really tiny in comparison. That's that's probably going to happen pretty soon with Electron, and it'll make Electron um, apps really small because they'll be shared as well. So if you have say Visual Studio Code installed then you've already got the Electron framework installed. So any, any other Electron app that you install is going to be, is going to be tiny. I'm going to rush this now. Um, this is just an example of platform-specific code um, where you're basically saying, am I on Mac OS? Then do something different for Mac OS, otherwise you're on Windows or Linux. Um, the, the most trivial case where I've had to do this is building my menus, where the menus are a little bit different on, on, on Mac than on um, other platforms. Um, this is how you use the original uh, file system API. Like you literally have to, if you want to, if you want to cut through the electron override, you have to require original FS, and that gets you the the, the normal FS node FS uh, file system API. Um, the reason they do this just quickly is um, so that um, they use a packaging format called ASA, and your application gets bundled into this, into this massive thing. And when you're using um, Node.js file system functions, you're, you can transparently load files from your bundle without even knowing it. Um, but sometimes that can get in your way. Like if you want to scan, you know, like I scan for user generated content and I don't want to look in the bundle, then I kind of have to bypass the bundle. Uh, I'm just going to skip this one, that's not worth it. Um, this is the structure of my application. So I just wanted to quickly touch on how this is a little bit different to uh, maybe a standard Electron app. Um, it's because um, I have to have um, kind of user generated code running under my application. Um, I basically have that running off to the side in a portable version of Node.js, so it's completely outside of Electron. Um, when the notebook editor starts, it starts this other process, and it uses uh, inter-process communication to send updates as you're typing code. It sends them across, and then when you hit the run button, it kind of sends a command across <coughs> and runs your code. Um, the other way of running back background, and the more normal way of running background jobs in Electron, is to have a hidden browser window. So that's just like you know, like your visible browser window, but you've just turned show to false, so you're hiding it. And that gives you a place to run JavaScript code that's not going to lock up your UI. <clears throat> um, the other reason I have to obviously run code, user code out the side, is you could do something silly, like Corey would probably like to do this. Um, you know, put a, put a process called exit in the notebook, and that's allowed, you can do silly stuff like that, but you're not going to bring down the editor, you're going you're to bring down the evaluation engine, and the editor's going to restart it. You would do that, wouldn't you? Cool, so that's it basically. Um, I have a couple of books to give away. Um, otherwise, um, if you want to buy a book, um, there's a code there for 40% discount for Manning, um, and also a code there for 60% discount on Data Forge Notebook if you'd like to look at it. And um, I've got. Because I haven't got Kevin here to do my random number generation. So. It's useful for so many things. That was literally on the last slide and I deleted it. <laughs> How many rows have we got tonight? <clears throat> Ten. Cool. So I'm going to give a, a book away to a row and then I guess a column. <laughs> and it'll loop back if it goes outside the... the so do do rows back. So, it's like a, so you do like a number up to like 
the maximum that we have, and then if it loops back, go to the next person. Otherwise, people get missed out, that's all. Okay, well, I'll, I'll just generate the numbers and you guys can decide who Correct. actually gets it. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then it'll be the strongest who gets it. <laughs> okay, so you want to count down to row five? Oh, cool. So, so one, two, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, cool. Alright. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. five. Okay, this is even easier than my idea. Yeah. So five people? Yeah. yeah. Right, cool. Person number two. Number two. That is Come on, yeah. Not really. You. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. Like your Google has a random number generator. Right? <laughs> okay. Who's feeling I like there's more than 10 rows, by the way. Okay. Okay. I count 15 rows. Alright, you feel like I'll do 15, yeah. I mean, it won't be 15, but it's short. Well, I didn't count with that one, so you can say. But I'll do 15. We'll do 15. We can loop back. 13. Okay. We'll one, two, <laughs> Lucky we had that. How many? <laughs> so, how, many one 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 how many people are in that row? So we, if we count all of this in one, we go one, two, three, four, five. Five. Okay. Five. Hey. Five. You don't. You, you don't have to come up if you want, but you just, it's entirely your choice to think it up. Um, or you could run it down. Um, all right, and we have to do this reasonably quickly. Questions, and I'm going to ask myself first because I got the microphone. Um, how do you deal with NPM installing random stuff in terms of security concerns? Because there's like a billion virus on NPM. Uh, there is no restriction, so yeah, what what you type gets installed. Do you have um, that in the uh, license? I am I'm, I'm indemnify myself, etc. No, I haven't really thought about it. Um, and I mean. What sort of things are there on NPM? Oh that man, are... you don't even know this. <laughs> Bad stuff. Yeah, no, NPM is yeah. real dangerous. Um, yeah. There's actually, uh, no, I'm going to wrap myself up here. Yes, just, yeah. yeah. Think about it. <laughs> <laughs> any, uh, any other quick, oh, yeah, go on. No, no, you're right, go on. Any other quick questions? Yep. Yeah. Uh, oh. Have you seen um, R Shiny? No. What's that? Um, it's a engine that enables you to take an R program with all the display and basically generate JavaScript and run it as a um, web page completely. Okay. Yeah. Have a heard of it? Sounds cool. Um, I'm actually, I've got to do a bit of restructuring so I can kind of um, make the kind of the language support plugin based and that's how I want to support things like um, CoffeeScript. At the moment TypeScript is just kind of lodged in. Um, I'd like to have that as a separate sort of plugin. Um, but you know, like other languages that compile to JavaScript, uh, like a, yeah, they're, they're possible in the future. I guess uh, sub question, your question as well. Um, considering that you're able to do uh, hidden windows, as you suggested, and and you can run remote script. Yep. Uh, that's first question. Like, you know. Why don't I run? Said, it? Yeah, because code? you can run pretty much anything. Yep. You know, mm. if it's if it's. Uh, the other the other thing is actually more from a distribution point of view if you want to sell and everything. Uh, Electron, as I'm aware, you can correct me, doesn't encrypt libraries. So how do you protect yourself from reverse engineering? Okay, so sorry, what was the first one again? Um, Security, remote and hidden windows. So I, I started this project uh, almost a year ago with running the user, the user notebook code in a hidden window. That, that's the obvious way to do it in Electron to get that kind of background process running. Um, but the problem with that is that... Um, you could have one or two or three or five, six, seven. Oh, yeah, those, cool, cool. That's what I'm saying. So, yeah. <laughs> so this, is, this is a question about the security implications yeah. of hiding. If, if someone yeah. is going to do that, I think if I want to, I guess, <coughs> I guess help or help you out with this one. Um, since you're only running your own code, you're going to do the hack itself. So it's probably okay. It's, I think the, the reason why our brains would know about one is you can install someone else's code on your own computer and get like Bitcoin miners and stuff, yeah. which is yeah. like a big problem at the moment. Yeah, so I mean like I, I do have an idea that I'd like to have um, example notebooks that the community can, tri can contribute yeah. and I don't, I don't know how I'm going to deal with making sure that code's legit. Mm. But I mean it, it's the same problem you get anytime, like Corey said, anytime you put something from NPM on your computer, anytime you clone a GitHub repo, it's the same problem. You've, you've got to, you know, do some 
you know, most of us probably don't most of the time, but you've got to look at the code and <laughs> make, make sure it's not going to do something stupid. For, Always you know, look at what you're installing, is what yeah. I would say about yeah. that. Yeah. And the other question was um, code obfuscation. I'm actually using something called, I think, JavaScript Obfuscator, which, which kind of jumbles up the code and, and minifies it and stuff. So but that's not, within installing window, uh, within the installer. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And did you have any troubles with 32 versus 64? 32-bit. Uh, yeah, version was no. No, I think it's um, I think it's 64-bit. I, I honestly haven't checked. Yeah, I believe yeah. Uh, the, the actual V8 engine, I believe, is 64-bit. Yeah, 64 64-bit. 64 yeah. mm. So, any other quick questions? Really quick. No. Good. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> From your experience, how do you find JavaScript compares to Python in terms of large data sets? So. I understand there are language conveniences when it comes to performance yeah. model marks and so that are you finding that it's ja close? Ja JavaScript, I mean, plenty of people are probably going to disagree with me, but I think JavaScript is a better performance language than, than Python because it's had so much work done on the V8 engine for that and, and it's been used by so many people, like, way more than Python. Okay. Um, Python gets its data science um, performance advantage from native libraries that have been around for a long time, so that's, that's why it's going to be um, better performance stuff than JavaScript. Um, we, could, we could do that in JavaScript. We can, we can build native language, uh, native libraries under Node.js. We could do that if we wanted to. Um, I mean, I don't see people really talking about it that much. I mean, probably because most people are already on Python anyway. But you know, that, that could be uh, something that becomes more of a problem or more prevalent if, if more people start and you know, to come to JavaScript to do data science, which, which they're not doing at the moment. But I'm, I'm doing my bit to promote that. And you know, if, if the community, JavaScript community wanted to make this happen, it would just happen, right? Because, um, you know, we, we could easily beat Python. They've just got maturity in their ecosystem, in their, in their data science ecosystem, that we don't have that too.